Hey folks, welcome to the Smoking Tire Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Babbel. It's important because that's a lot of what I do around here. Look, when you're traveling to a destination where you don't know the language, it can be really, really hard to accomplish even the simplest of tasks. I've traveled all over the world and before, you know, even just like a Google Translate software gets me like the very, very basics. But if it's not even like an, uh, 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 an Arabic letters alphabet, I am totally lost. Thank Thank God there's Babbel, the number one selling language learning app. Through Babbel's bite-sized lessons, you can learn a new language skill that you can actually use in the real world. From greetings, menus, and directions to gaining a deeper understanding of the culture, Babbel is a travel essential. You know, I... I've always wanted to like, I learned Spanish in, in high school, but I really like kind of lost it because I didn't use it. And now that I'm in uh, the parking and auto detailing business, frankly, I should probably pick it back up. And with Babbel, it would make the learning process quick and easy and give me experience I've never had before. Babbel's 15 minute lessons make it the perfect way to learn a new language on the go. See, other language learning apps use AI for their lessons plans, but Babbel lessons were created by actual language experts, over a hundred of them. Their teaching method has been scientifically proven to be effective. With Babbel, you can choose from 14 different languages, including Spanish, French, Italian, and German. Plus, Babbel's speech recognition technology helps you to improve your pronunciation and your accent. There's many, many ways to learn with Babbel. In addition to the lessons, you can access podcasts, games, videos, stories, and even live classes in the language you're studying. Start your language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. Double it up. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use c- promo code TIRE. That's B-A-B-B-E-L.com code TIRE. Babbel, learn a language for life. We are also brought to you by Netgear and their new Orbi Wi-Fi 6. If your Wi-Fi is struggling to keep up with your streaming, your work, your gaming, your video calling, and more, what about all of the above? It's time to treat your home to the world's superior Wi-Fi system with Orbi Wi-Fi 6 by Netgear. No more buffering, no more dead zones, and no more dropped Wi-Fi connections. And what I love about the Orbi Wi-Fi 6 is that I can use multiple items. Like, here's the thing. My wife is at home working, right, streaming video, video conferencing all day. I still got to upload my footage after a shoot. I still got to do my work. And so with this thing, I can do it all at once. The Orbi Wi-Fi 6 by Netgear is perfectly engineered to ensure a faster, superior Wi-Fi connection across even the most demanding and sophisticated smart homes of any size. Upgrade to the Orbi Wi-Fi 6 and untap crisp 8K video streaming, crystal clear audio with faster speeds across all your connected devices and zero interruptions. Ready to experience exceptional Wi-Fi? Upgrade to the Orbi Wi-Fi 6 and save 10% today. Visit netgear.com slash best Wi-Fi. That's netgear.com slash best Wi-Fi promo code smoking tire 10 you'll save 10% off netgear.com slash best Wi-Fi promo code smoking tire 10 Woo! we're also brought to you by autotempest.com I mean listen we know about autotempest I use autotempest today not even having anything to do with this promo. I had a client who saw the market for cars and was like, what is going on with used luxury SUVs right now? And do I need to get out of my Bentley Bentayga? I used Auto Tempest to see what the market looked like for 2017 Bentley Bentaygas uh, around the country. And oh boy, is it up. Man, it's a good time to sell your used Bentayga, let me tell you. (laughs) They make searching for your next car easy. You no longer have to go to these individual car sites like Carvana, True Car, and Cars.com. They bring in all those listings together, plus they even link you to Facebook Marketplace and nationwide Craigslist results. They now offer search alerts, so you can sign up to receive emails when new listings match your search criteria show up. All I know is I've never had a more convenient and easier way to search for the car I want across the entire internet and across the entire country. You get all the cars with one search at autotempest.com slash TST. Go to autotempest.com slash TST so they know we sent you.
All right, folks, it is a crew show today. Zach and I catching up on all the interesting things we've driven. We had a week with the Bronco. We got the Subaru Outback Wilderness. Um, I have had a very, very interesting experience uh, watching the Anthony Bourdain film and and uh, and its struggles and and my the stuff I've been talking about on this show along with it. It's sort of a, a nice little mesh thing that's happening together. And uh, we talk about the state of the auto market that's just completely out of control. Me and Zach on the Smoking Tire Podcast. Hey, everybody. What the fuck's going on? Uh, what the fuck is going on? How y'all doing? Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, Zach and I had a, a nice, beautiful morning filming the new Macan GTS, which I can't talk about Oof. until August the 31st. Sorry. Uh, that's because other people need to drive it first for fairsies. Mm -hmm. um, it's very green. We could say but, that. But yesterday, we drove the Bronco off-road, and we drove the Subaru Outback Wilderness off-road-ish. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah it's all, that counts. That's off-road. Yeah, we yeah. were on dirt. We, we were on, on dirt, road. and we did a few obstacles. So, yes, we did. We drove the Outback Wilderness uh, off-road. We drove the Bronco off-road. Uh, I also watched the Anthony Bourdain documentary and the Val Kilmer documentary. I didn't even know there was a Val Kilmer documentary. Yeah, and the Woodstock 99 documentary. I've been watching wow. all, all of those. Uh, I went open desk row on a new building uh, for West Side. Uh, and Zach and I watched a guy this morning uh, discover that his catalytic converter had been stolen in real time. <laughs> that was, it was that was a sad sight. Tell that story first. Sure, because I mean, it's short. It's short. And it's, oh. it's funny and sad. We came down off of the the hill this morning because we go up and film really early. Obviously, that's how you do it. And uh, we came down to get breakfast, and we're sitting at, at an outdoor table at this little cafe in a, in one of these uh, towns that's sort of at the bottom of the hill, and. Um, I see this guy across the street get into his, I don't see it because who would who would see a guy just walking across the street getting into a black Honda CRV? It's not the kind of thing that would catch your eye. You gotta we heard always it. be aware, Matt. We always. heard it. I heard it. And I was like, whoa, someone's got like a hot tuner car around here. Well, and you said, you're like, that's that CRV. And I looked around looking for a modified something <laughs> and I couldn't see it. And you kept saying it's a CRV across, like, on the street, on and the I kept street. looking like, around. I had what no fuck? idea. So then the guy turns it off, and he gets out, and he kind of like looks around the back of the car, like to see if his tailpipe is still there. I, I guess. Oh yeah. First, right, and it's it is, and so he gets back in the car and starts it again. And I'm like, oh shit. I think he's about to realize someone just stole his cat. Then he fucking sure as shit lays down on the ground, looks under, gets up, and just goes. Like just a, <laughs> just a fucking hand on the head, and just like trudges back into his apartment. Yep. And uh, and as soon as he was gone, like a few minutes later, I was like, I want to see. And so I went over and I laid down underneath this car too. And yeah, his fucking cat it got sawzalled out. Yep. I always forget that that's a thing that happens, but it happens like a lot. It's been ha it started happening. Uh, with increasing frequency, I think last year, early last year, there were more and more reports of it, and then it. I guess it's still going, and it's still a hot trend. Yeah, because it was just sawed the fuck off. Yeah, I mean, it's it, there was just a section like two feet just yeah. missing right from the middle of the guy's exhaust. The benefit of a wagon over a crossover is that it's harder to get under there to do that unless for sure. you have a jack. Right, like I would say, like that's the, that's an argument for air suspension. Ooh, you know yeah. what I mean? If you slam your shit. They're probably not going to bother crawling under there to steal your cats. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Felt it, bad for that dude because that's a, that's an expensive thing. Yeah, to replace that is going to be are like, five to nine hundred dollars. Yeah, they're expensive. Yeah, um, and uh, I had to replace the cats on the Le the million mile Lexus. It's nineteen hundred dollars. Ooh, because it was a dual. You know, it's the yep. It's a, it was a whole assembly that yeah. was both sides, and I think it was the. Interestingly enough, the LS four hundred was old enough, because it was in 96, um, where they made two different versions of the car. They made a 49 state and then a California version. Mm -hmm. And even though the car was built as a not a California version, replacing the cats in California, you can only get the California cats. Oh. So it was each side had an extra cat on it. 
that's why four cats total. That's why it was so. Yeah, it was four cats total. That's wow. why it was nineteen hundred yeah. dollars. Wow. <laughs> yeah. When my car was throwing check engine lights, someone was like, "Could be the cats," and I was like, "I fucking hope they're not." Fucking I just had not. to move the O2 sensors, but because <laughs> yeah, you know they're built into the manifold in my car, so right. the whole thing. Right. Yeah. Um, so I mean, it was definitely it's that's a sad thing to see. Uh, that's that, that's that's a sad thing to see when someone discovers that their cat has been stolen. Yeah, and it was so loud. Forgot yeah. that that's like just open header yeah. CRV. It and it was terrible. like you know it it wasn't like the night. It wasn't a, a dangerous neighborhood. It's like a it's like a more rural neighborhood. Like there's like yeah. horse farms up there and like agriculture workers and stuff like that. Yep. It's not like er, like the urban, like it's, it's not like Skid it's Row. It's not near a city at all. Right. It's like you get off a freeway, there's some apartment complexes which probably support the local businesses and then just horse farm agriculture hills. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's, man, it wasn't, it's like, I don't want to say like, like you just not the thing, kind of thing you think about. You know, you park your car outside your fucking house, and then there's like someone, just, someone in the middle of the night has like sawed a part of your car off. Well, I was telling you that my girlfriend's stepdad was uh, on a business trip with a rental car last year, parked at a hotel by the airport, and he walked outside. Cars on jack stand or on cinder blocks, and they'd taken the cat. Yeah, and he just calls Hertz. He's like. I don't know what to do about this, but uh, your car is here. I'm taking a cab, and the keys are at the front desk. Pretty much. Bye. You see that story that was, was circulating Twitter like over the weekend about the like an Avis customer who yeah. they repoed his car yeah. in the middle of a rental? Holy shit. What do you think that's about? You think it was just like mistaken? Like they meant to repo a different car, and some numbers got mixed up, and they got this one? I mean, maybe. I really, I read the whole thread. It's fascinating. He did good detective work figuring yeah. it out. But what's weird is if they were trying to repo a different car, you'd think once they realized what had happened, manager rep would call him and go, I'm so very sorry, <laughs> yeah. blah, 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 because that's how customer service works. But they just like ghosted. They ghosted and him and then sent a up bill. Calls, <laughs> and they gave him phone numbers that go to dead end lines. Yeah. Yeah. And then they billed him for the days that he hadn't returned the car, even though he knew that it was back on their lot. Yeah. That's I mean, crazy. it was really weird. Uh, I retweeted it. I don't know if I think you did too. I did so too. Go yeah. to our Twitter feeds to read it. It's like 16 pages, and it's really strange. And a couple really of uh, a couple of the the blogs and stuff. Like I think Jalopnik picked, picked it, up. it up, and some other some other place. I saw it like I saw it on some like mainstream like on Apple News. Okay, good. By the way, I look. I have Apple. I have an iPhone, so I have Apple News, right? And I I I, I have in my you know in my Apple iPhone web browser you know other news and media outlets that I like to go to specifically, but I have a, a somewhat curated, you know, feed in my Apple news reader, mm -hmm. right? It's just Countach news, I think. <laughs> yeah. I, but I am so annoyed. The shit that I see on, a, the, the, the benefit of the doubt that Elon Musk and Tesla get on the mainstream Apple news sites whether it's Newsweek or Business Insider, and even if it's comp even if it's shit like Forbes, where it's like bullshit blogger contributors that have no oversight and can just hit publish for fifteen bucks a post, like it makes it into that feed, and that's that's where a lot of mainstream people are getting. Mm -hmm. You know, not everyone is going to find a great Jason Torchinsky piece or a great Niedermeyer or Alex Roy piece that has actual, you know. God forbid a Missy Cummings, you know, article or something right. like that, which she was cited in a recent uh, in a recent piece that was accurately incredibly critical. Because I saw in the chat someone was like, "Ask Matt about the bot." That's kind of what I was getting at, because the bot is so obviously bullshit, right? And for a whole bunch of reasons, there's a lot of there was a lot of great pieces explaining why it was such bullshit, right? But the mainstream media. So uncritically, they, they did, oh, they're developing a bot. It'll be out next year. And they even went so far as to say it'll, it'll be 5'8 and 100. Like th these little specific mm -hmm. bits of physicality about this hypothetical bot were just uncritically uh, uh, posted, right? And um, this piece, in fairness, uh, does have Forbes. some some bit of criticism to it. We're trying to find a larger photo because there's so many ads on this. I mean, this website. one, it, this is one in the first paragraph. It says, "Hey, where's the cyber truck?" But but it's a, it is truly amazing the lack of critical thinking ability of these people who are writing, 
and they just say that he's doing it. Like, no one says, like, this was a guy in a suit. Boston Dynamics has been doing stuff like this for two decades and is nowhere near producing anything like That's this. That's what I found most interesting <laughs> is when, he, when they, he put up, you know, the photo and, like, he's like, we're going to use electronic actuators, which we're very good at. And I know it, I'm not an engineer, but I know that five days ago I watched that video we all probably did of the Boston Dynamics robots yeah. running along angled boxes in right. a circle and kind of hopping up and down on them. And I know that maybe his bot is not going to try to do those things, but you looked at the size of their robot and like the battery pack on it and you could hear the fans on it yeah. and all these different actuators. And it's like, they look very bulky. Well, so, the problem is that looks very he different. is presenting a quote, general purpose robot in the same way they're presenting open world autonomy as being a realistic possibility. But if you talk to anybody who works in, actually works in robotics, and anyone who actually works in autonomous vehicles, you realize how ridiculous this is. And I think, I think it was, it was it Torchinsky who said it? Like, if you wanted a helper robot to wash your dishes, that's a real simple, was it Torchinsky I think who wrote this? I don't know, this? but we have that. Right, like, <laughs> why, like why would something that looks like a human and might be able to like wash a plate, you know, by hand, but like, but it might also fall over. You have to watch it, right? It might one day just like fling a plate against the wall for no reason, malfunction. And the upside is it can wash seven plates an hour by hand under your faucet, as opposed to this thing, highly specialized that we have, that does this task for us already, problem solved, highly efficient, can wash, a hundred dishes, eighty dishes. You know what I mean? Like, and like, it's 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 already. You know what I mean? It's like there there is no. And oh, by the way, Elon Musk tried to build an automated car factory, which is literally where each robot does one thing and one thing only, over and fucking over. Period. And it was such a disaster that they now build cars in a tent. By hand with people. Well, don't, aren't aren't some of the uh, processes automated in summer by people? Well, like, a couple like a are. A are. couple are. Yeah, but but the the whole thing was. Remember the yeah. alien dreadnought. Right. The whole thing was supposed to be automated, and it was such a fucking disaster that he he even said, "Oh, humans are underrated." That was the tweet. The admission. That's as that's as that's as much as he would admit he was ever wrong. But there is no use case. None for a generalized helper robot. Because you can't, there's no such thing as a robot that works in an open world environment. That Boston Dynamics thing that runs on the boxes, it was programmed to run on the boxes. That fucking robot can't go to the store for you and get coffee. That robot can only run on those boxes. Now that's impressive, don't get me wrong. But, I think, and I think like, we will end up at a place where there will be general robots that just may be a really, really long time, not a year from Not now. in our lifetime. Mm, we might live to no 90. We way. might live to 95. Uh, there's 50 no more years, way. 60 more years? No. I, Specialized I'll, I'll, robots, I'll you, maybe. I'll bet you $100 today, which will be worth 12 But how did, how did Missy later. Cummings not convince you that open world brittleness is a very real problem? No, no, I agree with you. I think it's very, very challenging. I think the difference is like what it, he was talking about labor with these robots. So if you put these in a factory that they just have to move boxes but why? Around. Yeah, but why Why is a robot that looks like a human the right answer? It's as not. opposed yeah, to a, forklift. A, a box. Yeah, an right. automated forklift that reads barcodes. I mean, yeah. which, oh, by the way, we fucking have those. They're not glamorous, but they work. There's, if you go to any modern car factory in the world, probably Tesla included, there are automated bots that follow mm -hmm. either painted totally. lines on the ground or specific, you know, routes. They do repetitive shit. They deliver parts to the stations so that people can fucking attach them to cars and whatnot. They're not glamorous. Right. They don't fucking dance. They don't look sexy. They don't look sexy. Yeah. But there's a reason they don't look sexy, because sexy doesn't fucking work. Because function over form. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter if it's a robot. Right? Yeah. But, but, but robots should, should only ever, you know, not only ever, but like, there's just, it, it's, it's such fucking horse shit. It's such obvious horse shit. And it's so uncritically reported on in the mainstream media that it drives me insane. Nobody in the history of modern civilization has been given more credit for doing less than Elon Musk. I think, uh, let me see, when did that 
He that never is. has to fucking make anything. It's here's my dream. Buy into it. Well, a lot of the news these days is just about clicks and people get paid ten dollars and they're just like, here's the press release. Like we know that happens in the autosphere. Yeah, but as we learned from my Kuntosh article, shitting on something is good for clicks too. No, I know. So if these people were accurately critical about this thing, they would get clicks. Uh, I think we have to also remember that there are bots that write news these day these days. So it's very possible that the things are two hundred words and are just aggregating all over the place. Are auto populated. Is that the stock spike on the fucking bot day? Yeah. What so a I bunch look of at it. So this fucking is 8, horse 19, shit. So eight twenty was when I don't. I think AI Day was on the nineteenth because the article that we just had up was on the twentieth. Uh huh. So this is a spike from yeah. Uh, uh, That's the nineteenth. Six nineteen. It closed at six seventy three. Yeah. And then in the morning. So it's just it's just a fucking stupid stock pump. And then I don't know what's going on this last week. It's but. real easy to put a guy in a suit and say next year this is going to be a robot when everybody else is so complicitly stupid. Uh, yeah, it, I, I mean, I'll be very, very in a year from now. This seems like one of those things. Bro, like, I know. In a year, book. They just they just updated the Model S, which came out in 2012. That's yeah. a 2012 car with updates. There's there are no updates for their other cars. The Cybertruck thing is fucking unbuildable. We're gonna learn. Don't 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 get me wrong. We are going to learn. Everyone, I already know. I knew from the second I saw it. Everyone else will learn that it's unbuildable and garbage. Yeah. And and uh, best case, unbuildable garbage. Worst case, totally fake and fraud. Uh, it'll just be probably one of those things that falls by the wayside again. We may find out that presenting this robot uh, got them some kind of tax break. <laughs> just like the fake hot swappable mm. batteries when they took hundreds of millions of dollars in tax credits for presenting their fake hot swappable battery thing and then destroying the hot swap station and never hot swapping a single battery. Yep. But they kept the money. Mm-hmm. So Because they tried. Because they, they, they gamed the system. Because they displayed that they tried, right? Game the system. Everyone should read Neer Meyer's book. Yep. And uh, Tim Higgins is if you want another, another opinion, which I, I finished. Um... So anyway, that's what I think about the, their non-robot. It's not a robot. It won't ever be a robot. It's a guy in a suit. And if you believe him that it'll be a robot, you have no fucking brain cells left. Did they really demo someone in a suit, like walking around? Or is it just... You, thought, you didn't see it? No, I just saw like his renderings. That no, no, that, that is a person in a suit that did fucking dances on the stage. There's a video of it that, that did the fucking robot. I mean, it's it is literally... You have to assume that your people, that your fans, are the stupidest people on the planet that have no critical thinking ability, no fucking brain cells, and will just listen to any garbage you feed them. It is unbelievably shit. Look, that's oh, a guy. Yeah. yeah, of course it is. The suit doesn't even fit that good. No, no, wrinkles. If, I mean, if anyone watches this and thinks it's a robot, they no, no, are no one thinks stupid. it's a yeah, robot, yeah. but it's, but it's. It's the worst way to demo this. This is really <laughs> like, it's so fucking bad. This is really it's so bad. bad. It's so dumb. <laughs> like, and if you watch this and he goes so next weird. year, this will actually be a robot. It's like, what are you smoking? This is that's insane. This is really strange. That's insane. And he then said he then said some dumb shit like, well, we basically our cars are basically already robots. Which is about as dumb as things get. Oh, someone's knocking on my door. I will, I will answer it. This. What's up? Can you say Subaru answers? The keys right. to the Subaru. Sorry. Oh, boy. Sorry. Oh, boy. No, 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 you're fine. No, I should have put them in the box. This. Zach didn't put the keys in the box. Got to put the keys in the box, Zach. You know who wouldn't have done that? The robot. The, the robot, robot, the robot would have got it right. Yeah, right. I could fire my whole staff here and just have these robots park cars. Yeah. Probably a couple years, two years. This is something else. That, I mean, if you if you believe one awesome. word this guy says at this point, you have lost your last brain cell. What a damn! What I a, mean, look at this. This what guy, a weird launch. What a fucking Everyone asshole! Should just watch this video. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it's on the Guardian News. It's everywhere. And it's it is embarrassing. It is, it is several minutes of <laughs> like of trash. It's like a. Uh, like Looney Tunes, when someone's on stage, like just vamp for a while, and it's just Bugs Bunny, like doing the shuffle and other yeah. shit. That's what they're doing. This is it's crazy. literally a shuck and jive routine. Jesus, it's bad. fucking horrid. And and the, and it's and 
It's just, look, look at the headlines. Elon Musk announces Tesla bot. Elon Musk, the Tesla bot is coming. Te- tech crunch, Musk, the Tesla bot is coming. Like, why doesn't it say, why isn't that headline, Musk says stupidest shit in the world that makes no sense? Like, like you can't, we already know the general public is not smart enough. You need to tell them, tech crunch, why this is bullshit. Like, it, it's, it, it is the responsibility. Look, here's the, here's the quote. Basically, if you think about what we're doing right now with cars, Tesla is arguably the world's biggest robotic company because our cars are like semi-sentient robots on wheels. That is absurdly stupid. That's not remotely true, and it's incredibly dumb. Like, it just is. Sorry. Like, Well, I mean, to TechCrunch's credit, like, right here they say, they point out that Honda and GM have both had uh, robots that are advanced. Why are we hyped about Tesla? Is it just because it's Tesla, or is it because this is potentially a powerful vision that is powering it? Like, who knows if anything will come of this robot? Right, but first off, nobody reads. So it's very important what the headline says. What is the headline of that article? Well, okay. Well, I mean, now now you have to just get into a, a giant discussion about journalism right. and the internet in general. But oh, like, fuck, what did but, I just do? But the headline, all these, that's why, that's why I started, all these mainstream headlines start by giving him the benefit of the doubt when the track record says, don't listen to anything this guy says because he never fucking delivers on it. Um, yeah, they could get in trouble for libel with that, I think. I mean, no, I mean, I don't think so. I think... I think they just have to. I don't know. We'd have to. Other, have, have other, to ask I mean, look, other maybe. outlets. I mean, uh, other uh, other less mainstream outlets were critical. It's the mainstream outlets that are not critical. Well, and, and you want them to be critical in the headline. I think that's the main thing because this well, is like this is kind of skeptical. I wouldn't call it critical, but I mean, well, what, uh, it just it just. Uh, I agree with you that this will probably never come to pass. For the record, what I'm saying is that. We know that publications uh, across the internet are doing very bad jobs of reporting lots of factual things these days because they do it for clicks yeah. or they have robots that write the stories for them. I don't think this, this was written by a person, but and they were skeptical at the bottom. But they all have quotas like they're losing market share to Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, etc. And so they just need to bring people in or these things will fold. Which sucks because we, the people who read these things, are often getting worse content. Right, but, but the problem sucks. is it's like so many headlines are, Musk says this. Mm-hmm. Here's how Musk lives. M- things Musk does that you can learn from, like, no one's ever like, hang on, this guy's running scams. This is not an ethical person. Stop quoting him. Right, because that's not going to get the traffic. That's ridiculous. Because people, we love, humans love to see a billionaire or a successful person and go, well, what do they eat for breakfast? Because we go, well, if I eat that, maybe I'll... Be-. No, no, no. It's, and there's it's like so the much same more thing to with that his person. fucking stupid prefab house, his tax avoidance house in Texas. Oh, I'm selling all my properties. I don't want to own anything. Oh, my Gulfstream 6, though. Keep that. Keep my Gulfstream 6. I'll, uh, I'll live at a prefab house in Texas on my factory, which, oh, by the way, his company owns the entire town that that house is in. It's the whole town. Really? The whole town is owned by SpaceX. Holy okay. shit. So he lives on his own company's giant property in his little tiny house, but he can fly his G6 to anywhere at any time and stay in any fucking 12-star hotel or rent anything he wants. Like, there's no virtue in uncritically reporting, like, ooh, Elon Musk is downside. Oh, you mean he's sold everything in California that he would pay property taxes on? Oh, I okay. Yes, I, I understand. Ooh, that's a good point. Of course it is. Why does anyone leave California? No one will say it out loud. It's the only reason why people leave California. They I, don't want to pay fucking property taxes. I thought Rogan disclosed that, didn't he? He was just like, yeah, it's cheaper well, there. Well, he probably, yeah, he probably said it. I mean, it was $100 million. Probably. Yeah, or 100 million bucks for sure. But like, Elon won't say that because his company is the biggest fucking California welfare case in history. California has given him hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. And he's fucking, will shit on it. See, Boca Chica, they very, fucking a very small town until they, uh, they started building the facility. Bought it, bought it up. So anyway, that's that. I'm tired of the uncritical reporting when the actions of someone are the actions of a fucking charlatan. You know what I mean? Like there's the mouth moving and then there's the actions and they're not the same. So that's 
That's what the fuck is up. All right. Bronco was good off road. <laughs> yeah, we started with a catalytic converter. It's so funny. Catalytic converters. Uh, Bronco. Bronco's amazing off road. Really good. As, really impressive. Yeah. Really, really um, impressive. And we had. The Outer Banks, which is not the off-road one, or it's not right. off-road trim, it's the street luxury Bronco. Right. Which means all not all-season tires, but like lightly all-season mud tires. Yeah. Not lifted, doesn't have the Bilsteins, doesn't have the um, disconnecting sway bar, and only has five goat modes instead of six or seven. Right. Despite that, zero problem with the trail. Yeah. I mean, fucking just right up the trail, pick the hard lines, you know... Very little work required by the driver. Yeah. Um, and it didn't have hill descent control, which I don't use that much anyway, but with the low range, it might as well be hill descent control. Yeah, we, we put it in low um, first gear. And I mean, I think I took my foot off on a pretty steep slope and it was going two miles an hour or yeah. three miles an hour. Yeah. Uh, we reached my personal limit or high score of um, 30 degrees. angle of 30 degrees <laughs> 30 on that degree downhill. <laughs> we got a little two-wheel tilt. Yeah, we had a proper Ooh. seesaw. At one point, uh, we had a rear wheel that was at least three feet in the air. Um, you know, and, and it can, it'll can it lean over pretty far and make some poo come out a little bit, yeah. but it'll it'll get up that hill. Yeah. Um, it was, you know, it, it performed so well that it would be tough for me to, to justify to any non very hardcore off-roader that they need more. I mean, I can't I can't imagine what more I would personally need than to be able to get up a trail like that with ease. Yeah. Um, like we said, the, the only thing we noticed in the fire road to get there was that the regular shocks are a little bouncy. Like that it, was true. The suspension is tuned for the street. It feels like. Yeah, so we on were the street, it lot. was. It was the ride was really good. Mm -hmm. On the fire road, the ride was awful. Really, I mean, I was. I was shocked at how bad it was the second I hit the fire road. Now, we didn't air down, stock air pressures. Right. Airing down would help. Um, and it got a little better when I switched from two-wheel drive to four-wheel drive, because I think I was you got a little less hop from the live rear axle. Mm -hmm. um, but still, the ride was atrocious. Well, on, we were just kind of pogoing around yeah. in the cabin, and the comparison we had is because we had the Outback Wilderness there. That road, like a dream, yeah. I mean, it rides great by itself objectively but yeah. then when we went from one to the other we're like oh this is what a softer sprung softer damped car can do yeah i mean that was built by a company that builds rally cars mm -hmm. you know and so we it's also unibody versus body on frame but also sure the suspension was definitely better but uh the we talked with johnny about taking the outback wilderness up the up the trail <laughs> that our trail as you'll see in our bronco video it it that trail evolves and changes and uh, yesterday it was rocky um, and really rutted, and th there was no way. I mean, we could have tried, but we would have broken it. For 100%, we would have broken it. Yeah. Something, a phone call I wouldn't want to have had to made. Yeah, Johnny, was. I think the last time we did that trail, it was uh, more, there's more dirt covering the rocks, which mm -hmm. also made those little chasms smoother because they were filled in. And this time, much more jagged, which actually aids in traction a lot so i think those tires like the all seasons they perform well there yeah but like the land were, cruiser might not have gotten stuck if we went up at that exactly, day uh, exactly. whereas it did when it was sandy yeah um but the drops i mean we would have scraped a lot of stuff it didn't have the ground clearance yeah. um or the diffs or the torque really because of the cvt yeah, yeah we um it. having said that it actually worked out well because the difference between it and the bronco on the fire road was really like, oh, we should film this on the fire road because you can actually drive it like a rally car a little mm -hmm. bit. Uh, you can flick it and oversteer it into a, into a loose surface corner, which you'll see in, in the video. Um, and with that extra ground clearance and suspension travel, you know, you can hit stuff pretty hard on a fire road. You know, yeah. you can hit yumps and I, I jumped it a little bit. Um, you know, and you can uh, go straight over some ruts that in a, in a traditional rally car you would avoid because it would be not be tall enough yeah um that's a nice car it is that's it really, rides really nice that's a really nice car and under forty thousand dollars too starts at 30 it's like 38 grand to start which is 1800 more than the regular outback but mm -hmm. you get the clearance you get the, you can get the oh, skip plates for an option um it's basically really for the clearance and then like the bronze tow hooks and those kinds of things yeah, and the, the fabric inside is nice. Yeah, it's got this like water. Uh, it's not water resistant, but it's like uh, it's easy, e especially easy to clean. They're called StarTex, something like that. Yeah, I don't know. they got they always got to come up with these new names for yeah. the fabric. 
Well, they, they like stars because I think the Subaru thing. Oh, that and makes because sense. Because their their media system is Starlink, which is slow, and that needs an update. That <laughs> Works is as good as slow. Tesla's Starlink. It's pr- <laughs> it's not good. Um, it's fine, but man, does it react slow. Like just getting yeah. on the menus. It, yeah. It's like a couple seconds. Hit the button, then hit the button, then hit the button. And it and it, and it's not actually as simple as it looks. Getting no. getting through the menu like it, it took it take it took me a while to figure out where to find stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, Despite it's like all their icons are so big that they blur together, <laughs> so it actually makes it less intuitive to navigate. Yeah, it, and and it just it there's certain like there's a row of buttons on the bottom that's like one is the home button and then another one is for like car functions and like it's not immediately obvious which button you should press for certain stuff mm-hmm. i mean obviously if, if you use the car a lot you'd figure it out but like going back and forth between like my phone carplay and the radio like was not as intuitive as i wanted um i kept having to manually do it for some reason like if i had directions come up on carplay i'd have to like click back to radio that was kind of annoying um i the more i used the system the less i liked it honestly but everything else about the, the car is yeah. a lot of car for the money i mean yeah. front and rear seat trunk room is great it's basically as tall as my mach-e subaru considers roof it line or yeah, the roof, roof to roof okay yeah it's pretty much just at the same wow. height as the mach-e wow it did um, have a lot of headroom you had plenty of headroom yeah it's got a lot of headroom it was nice i mean in general and we still got it for another few days um so if you've got you know follow up questions that we didn't answer, we drove it a little bit on tarmac, we drove it a little bit on fire road, and we went over a couple uh, obstacles in the obstacle in the off road practice yeah, area. We did. Um, so you get you get a pretty pretty well rounded uh, 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 view of the outback wilderness, and we did two videos with Bronco. We did a uh, an on road and an off road video as well. So there's a lot of Bronco content. Yeah, I mean the compromises with the wilderness is it gets a little the gas mileage is reduced a little bit from the regular outback because you're you know higher up higher in tires combination of the tires and being higher up in the air um but there's also some like, like really good brake like i oh, noticed has, brake um, dive like when yeah. you hit the brakes like there's definitely there's definitely you know safari my it reminded me of my safari 911 um you know the body moves on the suspension a little more than a, a regular road tuned car yeah it's a nice um, little safari grocery getter type of thing yeah i forgot it has a lower um Final drive ratio they get from the ascent. That's also why the gas mileage is oh, worse. That makes sense. But it's Gears. The, it's the out. What do you call it? The outback of outbacks or something? It's, it's the outback. Yeah, the outback outback. Yeah, it's basically. good. It's good. Uh, I it, it was good enough that if I wanted that type of thing, I probably would skip over the regular outback and go straight to straight to that. You know. Yeah. Because it's just it 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 gives up very little. It's not like you buy an outback for its precision handling. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and what you get is more outback ability, more, right. you know, ascent stuff or um as like an approach car, like going right. to a crazy hiking trail or a mountain bike trail. Right. It's going to handle pretty much anything. Right. And and that. actually the the different modes like the X mode, like the mud ruts mode, it really did change the throttle response and and how what the gearbox did. It it it's a CVT, but it kept it pretty much where I wanted it to be, um, and it uh, that I figured out that was the only way to fully turn off traction control is to go to the mud ruts mode. Mm. And when you do, it's off. So that's that's good. Off is off. Um, and the in that mode, the all wheel drive system was biased a bit towards the rear. So it does allow you to do a mild amount of holding a, a slide. It won't let you really do it, but but it's it's it can be fun. On a loose surface, it would be fun. And if you were in uh, like sand or snow where you need to maintain that momentum yeah. and that wheel speed, that's what that's for. Yeah. And it would be helpful. Yeah, and and you know, that the C V T um it seems like they that someone at Subaru knows the times that you don't want that drone. Like if you're on a highway going from 60 to 90 miles an hour, it intuitively acts like a regular gearbox that does a fake gear change. Because it, I think they know that you don't want it to go, <laughs> you know, um, because that's just unpleasant. Yes. So, um, you know, it, 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 it does that mushiness a little bit, but it figures out kind of when the an- annoying times would be for it to do that and, and doesn't do it, you know? 
it's really quiet inside. Like they did a good job of hiding the sound and the NVH from the engine and the CVT. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but overall, I mean, and oh, by the way, Johnny was talking shit about putting the doors back on the Bronco on that show too. Zach and I did it in 10 minutes uh, with that. Literally, I timed it. It was exactly 10 minutes and we did not have to put painter's tape on anything. We were able to line it up and get them on. Um, I, I think it's probably not quite as easy as a Wrangler to put the doors back on. They are pretty heavy. They are pretty um, heavy, and, and got, we needed two of us, like like he said. You got yeah, yeah. One person has to like guide it, and the other person just holds the back. Right. Um, but it, it was not that hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really wasn't. No. It took a couple of minutes. You know, you once you figure out, like, okay, I stand here, and like, if we did it again, it would probably take us even less time. Yes. Um, and you know, once the door is hung, you know, you don't. It's not like you have to have a bolt for it to stay. Like, it, once it was hung, you know, you could walk away, and you could just you just bolt it up. So. Taking the doors off is fun. I mean, it's a little shady in terms of like, wow, I'm really exposed here, aren't yeah. I? Yeah. <laughs> I, I took it out to go do the beauty shots uh, on the street. And when I took you know a right-hand turn onto a big parkway at like 40 miles an hour, I was very aware that there was nothing, but, you know, seatbelt and my hands are going to keep me in the in the car. Right. But it was weird. It was a little unsettling. They have the, like an accessory, right? That's just like a tube frame kind of thing that goes yep. there, right? You can do that if you want to. Yeah, yeah. They have all, man, they have every accessory you could want for that thing yeah. sold through Ford Performance. And if you were off-roading and you weren't doing high-speed, dusty stuff, like, yeah, it'd be fun. You could just see more of the landscape, mm -hmm. be more connected to it, all that shit. It'd be fun. Speaking of seeing more in the Bronco, that front camera is very helpful. Yes. When you've got a high dash and you've got a high nose, you know, you're climbing a mountain, it has a really nice high-resolution front camera that pretty much just stays on. I mean, yeah. you, can, you can make it go away, but what, when you're in that off-road mode, I forget what mode we were in, mud ruts maybe. Um, it just stays on and it really helps you see what's happening under the nose. Very high resolution, nice camera. Yeah, very yeah, that good. That was good. And we had the big screen too. It's like 11.6 or something. Oh yeah, is that optional? Uh, is it with Outer Banks? It, with Outer Banks, I think it comes with it. Yeah, yeah, I would. It's good. If I was gonna get one of those, I'd get the big I'd get the big screen. I don't know what the other option is, but you probably want that. Yeah, that's a nice truck. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's worth it the money they're charging for it, I think. Yeah, I put the top on and off myself in about two minutes. Very easy. Yeah, it was. It's really cool. Yeah, they do a good job. Um, so that's that. We got videos coming of those next couple weeks. I think probably what day is it? It's Wednesday, so mm -hmm. t not next week. The week after is going to be Bronco yeah. videos week. Uh, next week we've got the Ducati. Ducati Monster, which is actually my favorite motorcycle I've ever ridden. It's a cool video, and I've got and uh, Macan. the Macan GTS On September first. Yeah, yeah. Um, I watched Roadrunner, the Anthony Bourdain documentary, okay. and I, it was really interesting. I think if anyone is a fan of Bourdain, they should see it. Um, if you aren't a fan of Bourdain, you might you might not get much out of it. Um, but you know, it was uh, what was really interesting is like for people that are into him, you know, especially when he died. Um, he almost got like, you know, deified, you know what I mean? Um, and so much of that is like, uh, because he had this, you know, way with words that was effectively translated into television. And so what is very interesting about, um, the documentary to me was how, you know, human it made him again. You know, it was it was like and and he even he said it himself uh, in the beginning of the movie that he idolized people like William S. Burroughs and Hunter Thompson and Ernest Hemingway that lived these sort of degenerate lives, but because they were so good at using the written word that their their degenerate lives became glamorous mm -hmm. somehow and and almost like redeemed. You know, it's like rock stars. Like we all look at rock stars who are so good at playing music and if they throw televisions or they have a destructive life or right. whatever, we go, wow, that seems cool. Right. But then what's interesting about Anthony Bourdain that is different from the rest of those people is that you can see in the film as he is going through his life, you know, his shows, uh, it seems, are really about him trying to be a better person. When he first started making TV, he was like a junkie line cook that had never left New York. Like, or not never left New York, but like never left the country. Um, or never really done any traveling and not really seen a lot. Mm -hmm. And it became 
super clear what how he shifted his focus when he started traveling into being like, wow, I need to like listen to all these people rather than just blah, blah, blah. And as he went on through his career, he became more of like a better person, you know, whether it was like a good journalist, a good father, you know, but he also had this sort of obsessiveness that came from being a junkie. You know, he like quit heroin cold turkey, but he never went to like recovery. So he he just kind of jumped obsessions, you right. know? It went from heroin to cooking to writing to traveling to jujitsu to his kid to Asia Argento. <laughs> and, you know, the last one, uh, you know, the it, it, it not necessarily it's not like oh this the woman killed him or, or anything like that I'm not blaming her but but they they were the they were two people that should not have been dating you know and his his obsessiveness and her problems like it was just that was going to be a fucking disaster but but at the end of his life when he became you know sort of this big voice in the me too thing that was you know his sort of pinnacle of taking up a cause but but ultimately underneath all that he was still like very human and while he's making this great television people would describe him as kind of an asshole you know and and having these demons mm -hmm. and that he that he never could run away from you know he was always trying to find a way to pour himself into something to run away from his himself and like i like i saw like a lot of myself in that you know where like i one of the reasons I like to smoke weed so much was so I wouldn't have dreams because I've never had good dreams. I've only had bad dreams my whole life. I've only ever had nightmares. I've never had good dreams. And actually, the, my dreams are starting to come back, and they're fucking horrible. Last three nights, I dreamt last night, two and three nights ago, I dreamt of driving a Cayenne down an icy road, and I fucking rolled it down a cliff and died. And I woke up, rolled it off an icy cliff. The day after that, I dreamt that I went to get a tattoo. And and it was like on my back, so I couldn't see what the tattoo artist was doing. Is it and Pontiac then, Aztec? <laughs> when they were done, I, the tattoo artist was like, ah, "I like this better," and oh, just did God. a did a different, a completely different tattoo, unrelated to what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I made some artistic changes. Yeah, uh, I hope you like it. And last night, uh, my dream, I, I drowned in a rainstorm. Jeez. Uh, yeah. So like, my dreams are horrible. They've always been horrible. And so like, I kind of like have used weed to like run from that and just other stuff like I've used my insano work ethic to run out from under my father's shadow you know to only varying degrees of success and even fewer degrees of happiness you know what I mean and right. so so I could I understood that perspective and I also understood that like if Anthony Bourdain wasn't a a very talented writer that that worked on his craft and and really had a way with writing much more so than actually presenting to camera. He was not that great of a presenter to camera. No, that's why his voice. That's why his voice is really strongly driven by voiceover, Correct. which is all very good. Right. And I think the benefit of that is that he's able to leave a place, reflect on it a bit, and probably craft a better story for sure and a little bit more wisdom right. than if you just react in the moment. They use all that stuff. The in person stuff is just him walking around staring at shit and him asking people questions and then having having them answer right. them and being a good listener. Right. That's pretty much and studying about a place so he knows what to ask. Yes. you know when he goes. Yes, um, um, and having uh, you know. Uh, and also his his work ethic, you know, his work ethic in terms of being on time, you know, doing what you say you're going to do, committing and following through. Like if he didn't have those two things, he would have just never, you know, he would have never been anybody, really. He would have right. just been in this ex-junkie cook, mm -hmm. you know. And so I think that there's a lot of there's a lot to be said for having those two things and how you can make them work for you, the ability to use the written word and the commitment to, to live up to your commitments, to be on time, to be ready when someone needs you for your work and, right. and it's like Discipline outworks talent every time. Right, right. So right. He, he was disciplined yes. and he put the work in right. to be a better presenter, journalist, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it definitely, it definitely took him off a little bit of that sort of godly pedestal that he ended up on for a lot of people, maybe including myself a little bit, after he died, you know? Well, because we only were getting 
the show we are presented right. as viewers, you know, that's what we know. Mm-hmm. That's as much as we know somebody because we know them for this body of work. And then when they die, we go, oh, but I love their body of work so much. We're not going to have that anymore. Right. That's such a bummer. And stuff like this, you learn more about their life and you just, you know them with, uh, with more depth. Right. Yeah, true. And I think that, um, you know, it was really interesting the way that his friends talked about him because they... They talked about him like a human with real with real problems. They were really straight, frank about it, you know. Um, and and I think it's a really good film. I really recommend it. Um, there was that controversy where they used a sort of an AI technology to turn uh, something he had written mm-hmm. into something he spoke. Oh, so weird. they they chose a they they deep faked his voice a little bit, and if you know it's there, you can hear it. There's a little there's ten seconds of speaking that doesn't quite sound exactly like his voice. They did that in the documentary. Yeah. Oh, interesting. And there was a, there was a bit of a controversy about it when when it came out, but I don't think it detracts from from the story, and I don't I don't think they do it to make a point that you know to make him say something that he didn't really say it's just that he wrote it he didn't speak it so they didn't have it recorded mm. they have a lot i mean they have a lot of there's obviously a lot of footage of him you know from long from for years yeah so um and it was really interesting i thought to watch the behind the scenes of his very first show a cook's tour when he has like no fucking clue what he's doing <laughs> um and that was like, oh, okay. You know, he didn't he didn't just wake up one day with the ability to to do this. Nobody does. You know, nobody wakes up with the ability. Like that's. But the other thing I didn't know is that at the very end, uh, before he died, the last few shows he made, he brought Asia Argento on. His director got sick, and he brought her on to be a director. So it's like him and this girl he's like obsessed with, and. The shows which I've seen, it's like a Hong Kong one and there's an Italy one and it's from that last season. They came out okay. You know, they're, it's not it's not immediately apparent what went on behind the scenes to see the finished product. But the behind the scenes are like, oh my God, this woman is like fucking up their whole methodology uh, for how they make these shows. And he's making these compromises that he just said he would never make, you know, because she's there and he's so focused on her that he he throws away a Did lot of his principles. Did they have the same principle. director for like all the seasons of No Reservations? Like, yeah. Or for most of yeah. them? Yeah, oh, and okay. for Parts Unknown. It's and like part, the same, same, the team, same right? team, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And so, so you can, you can I, you didn't know it at the time because it just wasn't public, but now in the film you go, oh wow, this is, it's not just like, it wasn't just like out of nowhere. Like it was like, oh, this is you. Y- you could see this tumble start to fucking happen. I mean, if if a show has the same team for a really long time, to and then, then replace them with your like, girlfriend. I mean, even if you swap it out for like another director or mm-hmm. whoever it is, I think it's really, really hard for mm-hmm. the team to make it feel the same because it's right. still going to have a different person. And if people can execute that, props <clears> to them because we've worked on things where it's like there's different people right. in different roles, and like you can usually see a difference. Mm-hmm. But you know, because uh, because he was his shows were such an inspiration to me and JF and 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 the people that that we know who enjoy that type of content, and I've you know how many meetings have I been in where it was like they're looking for the next Bourdain, which they'll they they won't find, uh, but um, uh, you know I think I think that it's 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 important to remember. Um, that this person was 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 not only human but was like a deeply deeply flawed you know human mm-hmm. and and so it was um a good bit of closure really i think on the on that i really enjoy watching i still go back and rewatch parts unknown and no reservations they're it's, great it's great television Absolutely. i really really love it um but you know um it was sad uh to watch but it was really in- interesting and it and it, it definitely uh, it was human and it, and I saw, you know, a little bit of myself in there and they, my own fucking bullshit that I'm dealing with in terms of the the anxiety and stuff like that. I had a fucking panic attack yesterday for the first time in a week, so I didn't quite run away from it entirely. I, but I, but I think I don't know. I didn't have a panic attack. I had a feeling of when we got back from off roading. Mm-hmm. I had so many emails, so many. And I had appointments in the afternoon that I had to run around and fucking make. And I, I had a deep, deep feeling of crushing overwhelmedness. 
and I fucking yelled at my dad for nothing. I didn't yell at him, but I was short with him mm. over something dumb. I apologized this morning, and this was not you. This was about me and venting and whatever. You should do that if you if you if you mess up. You should apologize. Mm-hmm. Um, but it it's you know you 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 can't you can't always run from it. You know what I mean? You you got to fucking deal with it. I don't think you, know. you ever get past like. I don't know, the more I learn about me and then other people is everyone's dealing with something mm. to varying degrees. Some people are dealing with much more difficulty than others, but pretty much everybody has something they're trying to fix or, or figure yeah. out or that's causing them a problem they're not aware of. Yeah. And you're never going to get f- probably fully past it because it's usually so deeply entrenched in who we are and the mechanics of our brains. Right. But you learn about it and maybe learn to manage it yeah. and then it has less power than it used to. Yeah, so I'm reading a book called The Four Agreements right now, which is a very interesting book that I we don't need to get too far into, but I recommend it. It really has, it's about, uh, it's basically saying that the world is hell. <laughs> everything out, everything out is hell. The whole world, page is, one, is hell. And but you, you can experience heaven on earth. And it's it's written by a religious person. I'm not religious. It's not selling any type of thing. It's more about here are these four things that you can do. Your life is based on a series of agreements that you've made. Like someone, if 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 you tell me that I'm fat and I I I also think that I'm fat, that reinforces itself as an agreement and it becomes like permanent. Hmm. And okay. it's about breaking those agreements. Like the example in the book is like if a child is singing and the parent tells this child, "Stop singing! You sound like shit." Now that child may never sing again, and the parent may forget that. But the parent, but the child already was insecure. Yeah. The parent said your voice sounds like shit. Now the agreement is you sound like shit, and you need to break this agreement by making a new, stronger agreement with yourself. So you, the idea would be in this example, I'm going to sing alone in the shower, and I don't care if I sound like shit. Mm-hmm. And you just, keep, you know, maybe now, now next you sing at a karaoke bar, or whatever. And you, you, you basically, it's very hard. It takes a lot of work, but you have to break those agreements that you've made in your past by forming new ones with yourself. It's right it's, that disprove the early that memory that is far stronger. Correct. Yeah. So we're trying that. Mm-hmm. Um. <laughs> it sounds like good stuff. It does. Yeah. Yeah. So you know. So anyway, it's not, it's a fucking, it's a, it's a long process, but still, no weed. We had, we had some caffeine this morning though. We did, we did, well, caffeine. I had less than you. I, I had like a 25%, like normal I had a, when I, I get in. I, I had, I decided you did a I was going to go to a half season, you know, 50% caffeine yeah. and see what happened. I think maybe 25 is right. Cause you've reset. So it, it was reset. I didn't really notice. And then we got to the, the, the driver change part of the video and we switched and I was like getting buckled in and you started literally snapping your fingers. Like yeah. not at me, like, let's go. It was more like you had extra Here energy. Here we are you, yes. doing the oh, thing. Right. We're driving to Macan and yeah. I was just like, caffeine working now? And yeah. you're like, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think maybe 25%, 25 calf is where it's at. <laughs> yeah. Once you started <laughs> scatting and bebop and I was like, I, I think, think, it's I think maybe that's enough caffeine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Man, I love this car. <laughs> I can't can't driver impressions are embargoed. Yeah, but I know. You know what I'm saying? Um, so anyway, you know that's uh, that's what's going on. I don't know what I said in the intro because I recorded it last week. So I said we were talking about things. I wonder if we actually got to them. I think we did. I think well, we did. We can go to the people. Let's go to the people. <clears throat> Let's go to the people. I'm sure there are the people have a few things to say. Um, no, oh, they do. How about that? <clears throat> All right, let's take it to the top. Uh, uh, Cameron, thank you for your donation. I really appreciate that. Uh, Frazier says, Michelin stars were awarded on making a journey. Wait. Oh. For the drive? What? I'm sorry. Oh. Like for a okay, so Frazier says that the Michelin guide was awarded on making a journey to visit because of the food. Uh, would I award a, for the drive like like a, a road, Michelin starred roads? Is that what that means? I don't know. Or is he saying, would we award Michelin stars for a certain car on a certain road? Oh. I, I don't know. Uh, for the, I, mean, I think, Frazier, if you're still here, put that in the regular chat and clarify. I'm not really sure what you're talking about. Um, it looks like they're still in the chat. Uh, you gotta, you gotta maybe use some more words. Alex says, uh, "What watches can I recommend with a purple face for a thousand dollars?" I'm sorry, I have absolutely no idea. A purple face? 
I, I'm sure I've seen watches with purple faces. Um, actually, here's my recommendation. My recommendation is that you call one of the custom Seiko people that I have worked with. One is uh, gone Instagram, Shadow Watchmaker. Uh, another one is N Horology Lab. Um, that used to be Seiko Lab. He changed his name. He didn't want to get any copyright infringements. And Horology Lab. I, I would go. Uh, I would have something custom made. A um, thousand dollars is uh, certainly enough money to get a, a nice tool, functional watch. Tool, tool watch is a, is a is a good thing here. Not you're not a tool if you wear it. It's a. Um, but purple um, is not a common dial color. Um, and so I don't know who makes something off the rack at that price point in the hue that you're talking about. But if you go to a custom, uh, a custom shop, um, you know, like one of the, like Shadow Watchmaker or N Horology Lab, who I've worked with on, um, on Instagram before, I'm sure that you could send them the exact color you want and they could find uh, a watch with a dial that is, um, that is the color that you're looking for. Um, there, there are a thousand dollars goes a long way in the in world land. in the world of custom Seikos, and you'd have a unique piece, which is also cool. Watch people love when they have the only one of something, and so that would actually be uh, my recommendation is to, recommendation. Have, to have a custom piece made. Let me see if Fraser replied. I hit him up in chat. Is there a? Is there a uh, no? Fraser has not replied yet. Okay. okay. All right. We'll, we'll come back if he comes back. Um, did we watch the 24 hours of Lamar? Negative. Not a minute. Nope. Not one minute of it. Um, thoughts of the new hypercar class? I To me, they look like LMP1 cars. So, like... I mean the hypercar class. It's not like they're. It's not like it's like LaFerrari and nine eighteen and, and Pagani racing. It's like they they're race cars. So yeah. the fact that they're called the hypercar class. I mean, in theory, do they have to build street versions of those? Is that the idea? Uh, ooh, I don't know. I should I should know. I that. mean, Toyota won the hypercar class, right? One two finish, right? They're well, not they, building they, that. Well, fucking they won thing. the top tier P one class, right? Is that not the uh, hypercar class? No, because I think the the point of the hypercar class. Uh, is to bring the cost down because the, for the the cost for the top teams, which is what we all kind of started to pay attention to and see with you know the Porsche 919 uh -huh. and um, Toyota's like TS040, it was so fucking expensive that that's why companies started bowing out of it because they're spending like hundreds of millions of dollars to develop these things that can really only so you know, who was in the hypercar series. class? So the hypercar class has, Alpine and who else? But I think Ferrari's coming back to it. Uh -huh. Cadillac's coming back for it. Back to it. So it has more restriction. So it's going to even the cost out for everybody a bit more. So you're going to kind of have high performance vehicles that are just don't have to be spaceships and cost that much money. So maybe it'll be more yeah. competitive and more populated. I don't particularly care about prototype racing. I mean, I I just don't. And if they're um, let's see. Hang on. Let's uh, pull that up. Le Mans hypercar is. Let me see the exact. You want to see the, the lemons one? No, no. Go up. Go up. Uh, the 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 Wikip I just want to see the Wikipedia. Like Le Mans is a prototype. Uh, wait. Prototype race cars used in the hyperclass uh, will be used in IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. Uh, spe yeah. They can either be competition spec versions of existing hypercars or specially designed prototypes with hybrid power being optional. When they start running shit you can buy and drive on the street, maybe I'll be more... Um, Hopefully some companies do that where they just retrofit a street car to run in it. I don't know if... I don't know who's doing what with what cars and what teams, but that's what I think the fans are excited about when they announce this class, yeah. is, oh shit, if we start seeing a Koenigsegg running that looks like a koenigsegg yeah. or a McLaren or whatever, that would be really exciting. Well, that's so what I thought like, it was, like but, but the stuff that was racing in this doesn't really look like that. And I know Glickenhaus can put a plate on his car. Mm -hmm. Like, I know he can. Uh, and good for him. You know, good for, the, good for them. Um, but uh, honestly... Uh, whatever was going on in Le Mans uh, this year, I just didn't find it interesting enough to watch. You know? Yeah. Um, I, just, I didn't either. Yeah. Um, I don't know what I was doing, but it was more interesting than that. Let's see. Uh, no. Nope. No, well, sorry, bud. Sorry, bud. Okay. Uh, Adam McFadden said, my family has had, my family, Matt's family, has had Jags and Astons. If money is similar... Which is the better 
Green on tan British Roadster to own. 2014 F-Type V6S or a 4.7 V8 Vantage. V8 Vantage. V8 Vantage. 100% V8 Vantage. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The V8 Vantage, the, 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 at the end of the last gen, is very good. Yeah. The four the four point seven, you don't want that four point three really. I mean it's fine, but it just is more noise than speed. Mm -hmm. Four point seven's a little quicker. Um, those are really nice cars. Yes. They look great, sound great. They don't have too many screens right. to age the yeah. car. Whereas the F type, even when it was new, like I like that car a lot, but even when it was brand new, that interior you could tell where the cost savings were and it looked like kind of modern, but not that modern. I mean look, my yeah. mom's got a fifteen F type V six S coupe. Right, and I just drove it when I was home last month. It's starting to feel a little old. Mm. The infotainment is feeling a little old. Um, certain stuff about it is starting to feel a little old. And hers, hers has very, very low miles. You know, hers has got like I don't know six thousand miles or something on it. Um, All right. Someone said uh, they think Fraser is saying that uh, normally stars are awarded for the food. Are there trips oh, or roads that that, that we are would worth award it for the for drive the alone? Drive? Just for this I mean, drive. so what does that mean? What are our best roads? I uh, mean, I mean, go a anything in northern Italy, any basically. northern Italy, Except any into Pelvio. Switzerland. Yeah, yeah, I mean, northern. You know, what trips are worth it for? I mean, um, the road to Hana in Hawaii is great, although there's like no sports cars there. Um, yeah, driving in Hawaii kind of sucks. The Ring Road in Iceland is fabulous. Um, you have to be willing to break all the speed limits. I certainly was. They don't give a fuck. There's, they're very obedient. There's very few police. Drives fast as you want in Iceland. I mean, the roads um, here in the canyons are amazing. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, drive- you, Smoky Mountains. Oh, Ojai Route 33, you know, um, the the North Georgia Mountains where I just was. Anything near the mountains is great. The the, the Dixie National Forest, which has been burning for two weeks, uh, northeast of Sacramento, when we did Performance Car of the Year, um, yes. A couple of years ago, those roads, I was Whoa. like, what? This is here? Those were some of the best roads that I've ever driven, and they were in the middle of nowhere. There's nothing around. Yep. They were beautiful. There's no reason to ever be in that part of the state except to go there. I mean, that's that's. If pretty you much find it. a mountain and then you find a road that goes between nothing and not a lot, <laughs> yeah. it's going to be good. Yeah. That's what you should do. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Ricardo says, is there a place in the market for a reimagined Mustang Fox body, keeping a solid rear axle for muscle car feeling. Like it singer is, money? The problem is you can't un box that car. It's not possible. A car that was built that poorly from the factory, like like with a nine with a, with singer, you're starting with such a high quality product. Really high quality product. The a nine six four Find yourself a, even a fairly crappy 964 and slam the door. That's tight. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Rev that shit. That's tight. Everything about it's going to be tight, even in kind of a crappy one. Unshitboxing is almost impossible. The best unshitboxing I've seen is Icon, and they have to rebuild everything. Everything. And I don't, I just don't know who, like, who would spend 300 grand on a Fox body? Because that's what it would cost. Because you have to re-engineer the whole car. Right? Well, I think like Detroit Speed will probably build you the fastest, sure. best handling, nicely appointed Fox body you can get or a comparable shop. But to go to that extra level of Singer mm -hmm. where you're pulling every panel apart and like re-engineering it, well, now you, you have Singer, you've replaced grand. the whole body with carbon fiber. Yeah, or so, that, yeah. So you like now take a Fox style. body right. and you've got to mold a carbon fiber body Right, and also, that's a bo like that's a body on frame car. Mm -hmm. So you need to make it like no, it's not. It's not really. It has subframes. It's not really body on frame. But like, unshit boxing that is just the you know things are made of plastic. You have to take all the plastic out and change it with ever something else. Like right. remember when Icon um, to go back to Icon, they unshit boxed the Caprice. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Yeah. And it was a million dollars. Yeah. And people went, uh, I'm sorry, what? it still looks like a Caprice. It goes, yeah, but there's no more plastic. We made everything out of metal, and that's why it's a million dollars. So, like, if you found someone who wanted that bad enough that they would fund it, and, like, nobody else would know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And so... It would be hard. It's a nice idea, and but I think the limit would be to go someone to someone like Detroit Speed, 
who could build you a Trans Am style car that would really perform, that would be much tighter than stock, that would look great and drive great. But I don't know who wants to spend the money to get a Fox body to that next level because at the end of the day, like, you know, for the money, like a Singer 911 or a Gunther 911, like, those are like, that's a superior product. Like, well, or you can spend 500 grand and go to like carbon recreations and they mm -hmm. do the repops of the 60s Mustangs sure. in full carbon. Yeah. Because I think the question is does the Fox body have global universal appeal like the 911 right. or no. like 60s Mustangs or something? Yeah, no. So probably not. So that's why that market's no. so much smaller. No. I mean, Fox bodies are cool for what they are. But, and there's, there's an argument that if you like Fox bodies enough, that maybe you'd spend six figures on building the sickest one ever. But beyond that, I think we're talking diminishing returns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Nick Upchurch is in the market for a first motorcycle, adventure bike, moderate budget, six foot five, 250 pounds. Uh, Want to be comfortable, but probably not ready for a super big heavy bike. Um, the BMW F800 GS is a, a good entry level um, adventure bike. It's uh, the, the 1200, uh, the R1200 has the big uh, box for twin. It's a lot more power and I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that as a first bike. Uh, the F800 has a parallel twin. It's a little narrower. It's, it's as tall or almost as tall, um, but it's a little uh, lighter, uh, easier to maneuver. So I might try something like that. Um, as far as an adventure bike, um, I mean, the Harley Pan America um, that I rode recently, and you can see my review of it, um, it has a, a big, powerful engine up to, I believe it's 170 horsepower, but you can ride it in a reduced power mode where it drops the power down to 115 horsepower. So you can really, uh, it was not super heavy. It's pretty pretty maneuverable, pretty agile. That height adjustable suspension means that you come to a light and it you know it settles so you stand on your flat foot. Mm -hmm. um, and it has traction control and ABS and all those kinds of things. So uh, you're, you wouldn't get into so much trouble. Alternatively, you know, something deeply used. You yeah, know, you, used you're, KLR. Use, used KLR. A, a It'll used, last forever. Yeah, um, yeah. Pretty much, uh, Justin Becker has a okay a 2013 BMW Active Hybrid three. It's a BMW. It's a 335 with an electric motor in the torque converter, and I love the hybrid powertrain. Are there any hybrid performance cars you're looking forward to at less than a thousand, a hundred thousand dollars? No, I'm I'm looking forward to the hi aftermarket hybrid was that the company Vonin Vonin like yeah. if more people try that that seems interesting mm -hmm. and kind of exciting but um, I mean know. no I'm sorry to say it's a, it's a one word answer but but I mean no I'm not particularly Im impressed I mean I'm impressed but I'm not excited by you know we just put up the video of the Acura NSX mm -hmm. which is impressive but I'm not excited by it by owning it and I, I don't I don't aspire to own it we drove the SF90 Ferrari impressive but I don't aspire to, to own that um, for me um, I'm not interested in performance hybrids I like EVs uh, I like and then I like engaging drivers cars and I think hybrids are great um, especially extended range EVs like the Volt are great as appliances if you can't charge as much frequently. Um, but there's nothing about a hybrid powertrain that inspires me or makes me want to spend uh, my own money on one uh, from a sporting perspective. Because well, we know it's going to add weight. That's the problem. You know, the things yeah. that, the cars are already getting too heavy, and then if you take something fun. Camaro or something, and then add a hybrid powertrain, mm -hmm. you're adding even more weight to it, which it doesn't need. Or right. a Miata, like you're going to ruin what makes it great, or a BRZ. Right. It adds weight it doesn't need, and it adds power it doesn't need. Mm -hmm. You know? Right. Um, I, I don't I don't think that, that the addition of that hybrid powertrain, you know, to go from a Ferrari F8 to the SF90 makes absolutely no difference in the real world. These cars are both insanely fast. Um, I know in the NSX, the hybrid powertrain is part of what makes the handling so magical. Well, that's cool, uh, and, it's, and it's impressive what it can do, 
but I don't I, I don't want to own that. I think that car just has so many other flaws that almost detract from how good it is to drive and, and the performance that it possess. Like the interior is so dull mm -hmm. and and constrained. It, like it feels small. There's not a lot of places to put things, and it's very uninteresting to sit and look around your cabin. Right. And that right there, you're like, well, if being in the car is so much of the experience in addition to driving it, and you've just lost that, yeah. it, it really reduces. And I mean, I know, I know the first NSX was not the most interesting place to sit either, but I think it moved this ball forward and we appreciate that more. Mm -hmm. um, but there's other options out there at that price point. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Brad has a 2011 Range Rover 5.0 HSE that just won't stop braking. Should I keep fixing it and stay in the hole or replace it with a 4x4 pickup truck diesel? Well, you're asking a financial question. How much money here. you got, Brad? This is a financial question. This right. is not a car question. I mean, it, there's literally nothing you're going to do with this range. Like, your Range Rover's not going to stop braking. Mm -hmm. Like, if it's been braking over and over, like, it ain't getting newer. <laughs> the parts the parts aren't, uh, aren't going to be in any better condition. Um... You know, you're talking about a 10-year-old vehicle that was designed with a 10-year service life. You're at the end of the the intended service life. Like, I've learned this at press launches, what intended service life is. Um, Range Rovers do not have an intended service life beyond 10 years. Wow. They do not have an intended service life beyond 100,000 miles. Wow. So if yours is older than that and it works, has more miles than that and it works, you are the exception. You're not the rule. Um, the only vehicle that I know of that is designed with an intended service life over 10 years is the Land Cruiser, which is a 25-year design. And that's why it's a $90,000 Toyota, because the actual hardware is more robust. And the things that can break are simpler and durable you know, and proven. Mm -hmm. Old Range Rovers, I mean, if you're dumping money into it now, you're going to keep dumping money into it forever. So... I can't tell you to, to replace it with an F-250 because I don't know if you want to be driving around an F-250. I feel like but. the fact he's asking, it tells me that you don't love it anymore or as much as you need to to yeah. keep throwing money at it. Like If you can get something, especially a newer pickup truck that's going to have lots of new features, ride nice, be quiet, uh, they do a lot of things really well that they didn't in 2011, you might be just as happy with that as you would with the Range Rover. Right. And yeah, you don't get to like pull up and be like, oh, I have a Range Rover, but but your that's Range not Rover's a cool ten thing years to do old when it's broken all the time. <laughs> yeah. Try, you know, ask me how I know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Having a having saying you have a luxury vehicle, but the reality is your luxury vehicle is never quite right. Mm -hmm. That's not good. Yeah. Oh, where is it? Oh, it's in the shop again. You know, you, yeah. you don't want to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Swervin08 wants to know where do we get our plain T-shirts. Actually, I've been buying them at Vuori. What's I don't know what Vuori. It's is. like one of these like it's almost like Lululemon, but they haven't figured out that it's Lululemon yet. Mm. You know what I mean? Nice. It's like technical fabrics. Right. It's V U O R I, and I've been I've bought like ten shirts from them recently. That's where I get my plain T-shirts. Bought them on Amazon, and once I found a pack I liked, I just bought twenty of them. There you go. I have twenty black T-shirts. There you go. Uh, Kevin says with the next generation C sixty three moving to four cylinders. Uh, uh, in your opinion, will V8 C63s begin to hold their value? Uh, the model is the E92 BMW. Look to the E92 BMW M3 and its its uh, its residual values. Um, I think there's a floor. You know, will mm -hmm. they will they begin to hold their value? I mean, it, there is a floor, right? I, and they will not go below that floor. I yeah. think. Yeah. And so that's so. Yes. I mean, look as. I think to, to right now a manual gearbox E92 M3 is more desirable than it was when it was new. Because uh, yeah, probably. Because it sounds great. Mm -hmm. You know, the styling has aged very well. Well, when it was new, I think it was also kind of king of the ring when it was new because at the time the C63 had such a shit transmission and was just like a, the the attitude of that car was different, right? Mm -hmm. And now but the C63 that came out like two or three years ago yeah. that also turned really well and shift quickly, Those I feel are like hot. that's the sweet spot yeah. for the C63. Yeah, not like the boxy ones. Right. Like the, 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 the current gen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, those are fantastic. Those are very good. Uh, Sean says, for 35K, would you prefer a Veloster N or a new 86 for fun experience? Ooh. I mean, here's the question. I, I assume this person is not asking 
th- th- that's an only car question. Because yeah. you wouldn't buy a Veloster N as a weekend toy, no. right? Um, the real question is, do you need a back seat or not? That's really more, I mean, do you want to drive the front wheels or the rear wheels? And do you need a back seat? That's much more important than which is fun. Both of those cars are leaders in their class currently. But a front drive experience and a rear drive experience and a car with a big trunk and a, and a, and real rear seats versus a car that doesn't have those things it has a real trunk but it doesn't have real real rear seats we're talking about real world practical differences mm-hmm. so in a vacuum where it's just my fat ass and nothing else i'd rather have the 86 because the steering is is a little better um and a, a rear drive experience is preferable to me. Yeah. All other things being equal. If I could only buy one car that I had to actually live with and carry stuff and carry people and get in and out of 50 times a day, I'd probably rather have the Hyundai because it would probably be easier to live with. Yeah. It is more livable. Yeah. And the, and, uh, uh, um, I got bruises on my knees from the 86. Um, did we watch the uh, Andre says? Did we watch the Idris Elba King of Speed? Uh, I didn't. I didn't. I feel bad that I missed it because I heard it was good, but I didn't see it. Mm-mm. Sorry. Uh, this is Fraser's follow up, which we may have answered. Yeah, I, I still don't understand. Are they, not, not oh, they're used in Europe to suggest a place to stop, and others you should make a specific journey to see. Not all restaurants are on a good road. So, if he's asking what about re- what restaurants are on good roads, I don't have the first clue. I mean, getting to the top of the Stelvio Pass and having an espresso and a crappy pizza, and the road's too busy, <laughs> and the road's too busy yeah. is disappointing. Um, typically, places that are in the middle of nowhere on great roads do not have great food. There's that place, Deals Gap, on T- Tale of the Dragon. Garbage food. Terrible cheeseburger and average fries. Right, but if you're the only but, game in town. But you're the only game in town. Right. Um, you know, Newcomb's, you know, I, I, I'm i sure there are, a, there's a restaurant somewhere that's on an amazing road and it's worth getting to. Oh, you know, there's one. I can think of one in L.A. Saddle Peak Lodge. Saddle Peak Lodge is in the canyons. In the Malibu Canyons, it's at the bottom of Payuma. And it, it's like driving into uh, a Colorado log cabin. And it's one of those places that serves a bunch of different kinds of meats. You can get boar and elk oh, cool. and stuff like that. And it's a very high-end restaurant. Um, it's a little snooty, huge wine list, uh, a very interesting experience. Uh, and you don't, you don't have to drive the Canyon Road to get there. But if you drove Payuma to get there, it would be, a, it would be very nice. So... Yeah, Saddle Peak Lodge in Malibu. That's where food intersects with road. Or Malibu Rocky Oaks uh, Winery. Oh, yeah. You know? The place is nice. Yeah, there's definitely, like, in Northern California, you know, there's definitely, like, some Alice's Restaurant, you know, is up in up there. And nothing wrong with it's Alice's fine. Restaurant. Yeah. They make a nice tuna sandwich up there. It's not, a, it's not getting Michelin stars, but it's a good drive, so... Sure, there's you can get an okay meal on a bunch of nice roads, but like in Big Sur, there's some fancy um, stuff with some uh, that you need a curve. Okay, road what to about get to. or uh, the Point Reyes Oyster Place in Point Reyes? Mm-hmm. You can go Highway One north of San Francisco uh, through on the coast there yeah. to that the to Point Reyes, and they've got fabulous oysters. Yeah, because they harvest yeah. them outside. Okay, so actually, yeah. we do have a few here in Los Angeles in the California area. There's a few, yeah. Okay, James Christ says, "Is the Lotus Exige driving experience worth more than ten worth ten k more than the Elise when used for track and spirited driving?" No, in fact, I think it's worth less because you can't take the roof off. Ooh, the uh, best Lotus is the Elise SC, which has the supercharged engine from the Exige, but you could take the roof off, and it doesn't have the spine that the doesn't have the um, suspension that crushes your spine. You don't want that. So the Elise um, is the one to get. The Elise SC okay. with the supercharger on it. So you get the 240 horsepower engine in the regular Elise body with the removable roof, which you want, right? Right. Um, these are the last three. Okay. But, um, uh, just um, leave it up there. Uh, SL Tillum, uh, love the two takes. Do we ever scare each other behind the wheel? No, not really. Extremely rarely. Extremely yeah. Rare. No, I mean we uh, we uh, no. There's very few people I'm comfortable uh, being in a car with at speed. Most of them have competition licenses, and the other one is Zach. That's pretty much it. Uh, Spencer Flynn, have we seen the 
Fast and Furious parody super fast. If it's the mm -hmm. YouTube cartoon, yes. Is it a YouTube cartoon? We'll check that out. I haven't seen it. Is it super fast uh, parody? Is it a cartoon? No, it looks like it's got actors in it. Oh, shit. All right, we should watch this at really? some point. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll watch this in between podcasts and we'll get back to you. Uh, let's see. Yeti Nerds. I have a 2017 Macan GTS. Uh, the new M3 has all-wheel drive now. The new Macan GTS has good power. I'm not into cute utes. Which would you daily drive living in a climate that has winter? The Macan. Yeah, ground clearance. Yeah, straight up the Macan. Yeah. Uh, Adrian Polito says uh, the GX470 is the answer for... All SUVs. It's the Miata of 4x4s. I think the Jeep Wrangler is the Miata of 4x4s. The GX470 is a very nice truck, though. Yeah, uh, getting no. very popular for the overlanding crowd because yeah. people were didn't really know about them or weren't paying attention. They didn't realize that it was the Land Cruiser Prado in other markets. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that, the GX470 is badged as a Land Cruiser in all markets but America. Uh, last one, Tommy Totally. Uh, thoughts on upcoming C8 Z06 uh, and... Do I think it might make a good canyon carver? No, no, it would be a piece of shit. Why That's would it be, good, yeah. it be fucking junk? Yeah, it's a You see it's that a video with the new right? rigging? Yeah, why would you want to fucking drive it in the canyons? It looks like shit. I don't know. It's front wheel drive, which is weird. <laughs> yeah, no power, um, terrible sound. It has sound. a fifth wheel in the back. Yeah. I'm not sure what that's for. Yeah. And then the, the roll center is really, really high because it's double decker. Right. Habibi, come on. Of course, the Z06 is going to be fire. Did you watch our base Corvette video? Our base Corvette video is, is such a good so car. So fire! It is a very good car. I mean, will I choose something else for the money? We don't know how much it'll cost, right. so there's no there's no thing. And I will say that I I don't know about the quote for the money part of it, but I have chosen something else. <laughs> <laughs> I I sold a car and I ordered a car and it's not a Z06. Now, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean I don't think the Z06 will be cool as fuck. I think the Z06 is going to be fucking sick. I mean, I've heard it. It sounds like a Ferrari. It yeah. sounds awesome. But buying a car that you haven't tested is Oh, it wouldn't risky. be that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that that bit me in the ass. Focus RS, that was an extreme fail. Right. Yeah, I learned I never again will buy a car that I haven't um, spent a bunch of time driving first. And uh, somebody in my position has that luxury. All right. That's our show. I'm going to go home and do a Red Bull Rich Energy blind taste test for Alanis King's Rich Energy book. I'm excited that you found Rich Energy. I had four cans left from someone gave to me. They expired uh, October 2019. What do, you think, what do you think is going to happen? Nothing. I don't think anything in there can go bad. No. no. I think it's going to be think it's bad when rich it gets energy canned. and the cockroaches. Yeah. And fortunately, I have equally expired Red Bull. So it's not like I'm doing a fresh. <laughs> I found it in the cabinet next to Red Bull that was just as old. So <laughs> You have equally. Okay. Yeah. So it's really a control sample. It but, really is. Yeah. I mean, that's good. It's not like it's a fresh Red Bull. And then I had I have three cans left because I cracked one at one point. And so, so I put two in the fridge. So we could try them cold, and then I've got a, a warm one also. Got it. So this is some really stupid science that no one cares about, but I just want to be in Alanis King's Rich Energy book. <laughs> so this was You are going to be energized this, was, this afternoon. Oh, we're sipping. Okay, no, I'm good. just going to sip. Sip and spit, like no. wine tasting? Oh, I could. Yeah? Get, I could. Get one of those big glass things you just spit in. I just, could. Mm. I only really need to take a couple of little sips, though. I get I notes of pastrana <laughs> on the back. This tastes like that guy's beard. <laughs> Um, I don't know what we're doing next week for podcasts. I can't remember. It doesn't really matter. Um, but thanks for listening to this one. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll see you later. Bye.